All right, let's oh. talk about money going into science. Uh, so I actually want to kick it off with, um, you know, we hear a lot about some of the wild, crazy things coming out of Silicon Valley and around the world in the world of biotech. But I want to hear from each of you what you've seen that is sort of blowing your mind right now. Because I think a lot of the time we talk about, uh, you know, we've got like the meat in, in petri dishes and we hear all this stuff. But what are you seeing that's real right now? Do you want to go kick us off? Oh, gosh. Um, I think hibernation biology is the most fascinating topic um, in longevity science and in general right now. OK. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Arvin. So I want to get into that later, by the way. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we're seeing, uh, it, we're really focusing on two ma major areas, planetary health and human health uh, as big categories. And, so from the human health side, we're seeing new ways of treating disease and actually getting to cure. So immunotherapy is immunomodulation as a general modality uh, is remarkable and amazing. Uh, looking at the microbiome as a modality is also uh, really amazing. Uh, but really, um, on the planetary health side, the ability to create entirely new industries is, is um, really remarkable, and that happened about three years ago when you talk about meat and petri dishes and uh, what is now called cell-based meat. Uh, and so thinking about how entire industries like the food supply I mean, you're, chain... You're basically changing invested. everything. Like, you're, you're making, you're talking about making it so that we're not, we're no longer having this, like, this uh, cattle in cages moving it towards, you know, building something in a lab instead is what you're talking. It's That's like right. an entire... Industry. It's about like taking, changing the factory. So I think yeah. the general trend that we're seeing that's so exciting is moving away from treating symptoms, whether it's symptoms in humans or symptoms in the planet. Like, okay, we'll put a band-aid, like let's reduce the carbon in, in the atmosphere uh, by doing carbon credits. Well, let's get to the root of it which is the actual agriculture, and change the factory from a cow for protein to the factory of, say, stem cells and growing those out in bioreactors. The actual end product is the same, but you treat the root condition. Nina, what are you excited about? So I've been uh, in this industry since 1999, and I feel like this is an unbelievable golden age right now. And I thought that in 1999, it was sort of the sequencing of the genome, the early cell therapy, the first gene therapy efforts, oligotherapies, one by one failed, including catastrophic failures with human deaths. And today, we've got three gene therapies approved. We've got two CAR T therapies uh, for cellular therapy. We've got the first RNA interference drug approved. And we've got hundreds, literally hundreds of gene therapy and cell therapy uh, clinical trials that are doing root cause disease cure, as well as really harnessing the human immune system to treat disease. And I think it's because the tools, all of the learnings of those decades, but also the tools that we have at our disposal today in synthetic biology and in uh, gene editing are making the science translate in a way that we just couldn't have believed. I, I spoke to two CRISPR scientists yesterday, two uh, founders of uh, CRISPR startups, and they were saying that you know it's just around the corner when we're gonna be able to walk into a drugstore, uh, they'll look at our genetic information and you have some kind of a CRISPR therapy right there to take care of whatever ails I'm you. I'm super nervous about it. It's just around the corner. We're going to walk. This is the matronly. I've been in this business too long and I'm a little grouchy about the walk into the drugstore and buy these off the shelf in a very near term timeline. But I think it's unbelievable that we have the first clinical trials with CRISPR gene edited um, human cells. I think it's Phenomenal. Yeah, you mentioned you're nervous. What, can each of you tell me, like, how do you separate when you're looking at investments? What, how do you separate the hype from what's real? Hmm. You want to start? Yeah, go ahead. One thing is people. I think you know there's um, there's an incredible underpinning in the talent and the leadership and the experience. What's really exciting to me about and and to be talking about biotech at TechCrunch is such a privilege, and I think it's a sign that the convergence is at an all-time high. But I think the, the critical piece is really combining the incredible audacity of new innovators, scientists that are coming straight from the laboratory with new inventions, with really seasoned veteran drug and technology developers that understand translation, understand all the preclinical models, clinical execution, 
especially regulatory and what it really takes to bring a product from a really great concept uh, into patients and then onto, onto market. And so for me, a lot of the sorting of the hype from reality is, do we have not just, as, as people say, you know, do you bet on horses or jockeys? And I really think it's important to be betting on, on both. And I think this life science is hugely a jockey jockey and leadership business. Were any of you, were any of you skeptical of uh, Theranos' offering when it came up? Were you like, that sounds interesting, or were you, did your tweakers go up? Yeah, you, let's you, go, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, you know, that Theranos was outside of uh, my field of view at that time, right? So it, it was as much as a news art item for me as, as for anyone else. But it was, the, the biggest thing about Theranos is the data was just never shown. And, you know, FDA was being skirted, and that was an active act of fraud from what John Kerry Roo was, uh, right. has reported on. And so I think, you know, again, no one up here would invest in companies where you didn't see underlying data first. And again, it comes back to people, so people, data, uh, as well as for us at IndieBio, um, the how big of a problem are you trying to solve? And I think like that, we see biology as a technology uh, and that can be applied to world-sized problems. Like I said, planetary health and human health, um, either cures or ways of reinventing industries rather than selling assets into industries. And I think like that, that's a big thing for us. Uh, so on the healthcare side, you're seeing it with like Oscar, right? Rather than try to sell an asset into an insurance company, well, let's just, disrupt that whole industry in the first place. So that's what we're looking for. And then the types of people that can drive that all the way uh, through execution uh, and the types of people that will take the coaching and the network and bring them in because those types of companies take huge amounts of, of talent, people, and energy uh, to, to actually make happen. You know, Canon has been investing in diagnostics for 25 years and been looking for the holy grail of multi-analyte, multiplex, yeah. really low patient blood sample volume, being able to get rapid readouts and to do it all in a box that could be at point of care in a home, in a doctor's office, or in a drugstore or grocery store is an absolute holy grail. But because we have some combined, I think, 75 years of experience in med tech and diagnostics investing, we understand how hard the chemistry and the immunology is. And so when that opportunity was presented to Canaan without data and some systematic explanations of what's different this time, it was not something that we were going to take a serious yeah. Yeah. look at. I think it was an audacious plan, and, and I, think, I, I think we should not give up on that idea because we had a public catastrophic fraud. It's dissolving this week, in fact. That's yeah. dissolving yeah. this week. Um, and there are other companies with that same value proposition. Their slide deck looks a lot like the Theranos slide deck looked, but they've got data, and they've got a credible regulatory plan. And I think that's a huge differentiator. Laura, I want to switch gears a little bit. You, you're you looking at biotech, but in the realm of longevity. Yeah. And something I think that's very fascinating is you're so young, and yet you're looking at longevity. So I want to know why you jumped in specifically into longevity at such a young age. You're 24, 23? Uh, yeah, exactly, yeah. 24. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I grew up in New Zealand. Um, I was in love with science since I was a kid, and when I was 12, um, I emailed a biologist here uh, and asked, hey, I'm 11 years old, I'm, you know, I love aging science, can I come work in your lab? Um, and, oh, well, there was a couple of steps to that story, but she eventually showed back and said yes. And I was like, wow, I live in New Zealand, like, this is great. Um, how do I get to California and figure all this out? Um, and I think one thing that we really care about at our fund is just allowing more people of all stripe and color to kind of like come into biology and start companies um, and, and not be ageist or, or focus on the younger spectrum. I think also, you know, for example, my mom is in her kind of like later stage of life and thinking about like medical school and that's amazing, right? Like um, how can people of all ages kind of come in and start companies um, that they're fascinated by? Um, but I think that's something that we were really interested in at the moment is, is just kind of, you know, independent of, of age or kind of background. How can, you, how can we push the science forward a bit more? I also yeah. think one of the things that I love about what Laura is doing is in framing longevity, 
there is a, a Peter Pan syndrome alive and well in Silicon Valley with all sorts of strategies to think about how do we Use have the young blood to, vitalities into yeah. our 90s. But I think the study of longevity and cellular aging phenomenon and the physiology is also going to underpin a lot of our understanding of human disease. So I think there's a complementarity to not just long livedness, but what does that mean for for vitality and health. Yeah, it's actually, fa- oh, sorry, go ahead. Uh, uh, I was just about to say, uh, for me, it's a great indication of shifting from the genetics mindset. Everything is a gene, there's a genetic root and there's a genetic you know, solution to a me- metabolic uh, root and a me- metabolic solution. I think those two to get together will reshape healthcare. It's not just what you're born exactly. with. Exactly. It's, it's how, how that cell is actually metabolizing things. And those two things coming together is actually a holistic type of solution. And, and the behaviors that dictate what, that can dictate some of those exposures right. that alter that That's metabolic right. process. Yeah, I mean, but I also just, yeah. I think there is highly programmed aging. Like if you look across species, right, there are some species that do not age. Like, you watch them across their life, and their mortality rate goes down with time. So it's like, that's amazing. Like, tortoises are just, like, getting healthier with age. Like, how, how can we learn from them? There are species that kill themselves after they reproduce. And so it's like they have a program switch, and past a certain age, they're just, like, down. Like, octopi sit on their eggs, and their mouth goes away. And so if you switch that gene off, that they're still, they live a lot longer. But, like, you know, they're just, they're programmed to age. And so there's a question of, A, are we programmed to age? Menopause occurs, you know, at a very specific time point. It's a clock. And you get way worse at a very specific point from a health perspective, like, immediately, um, if, you're, if you're a female. And, and so, like, there, there's just all these questions of, you know, maybe, we, maybe we're not programmed to age, but there are certainly indications that we are on some level. And how can we affect those genes? How can we kind of change those programs? So it's not just that parenthood ages us prematurely? <laughs> <laughs> I, I do want to switch gears. Um, so what we're talking about here is there's the technologies and everything, right? That's why we ha- talk about biotech on TechCrunch. That's why I write about biotech because there's it's not just you know therapies developed in some drug lab and you know with Pfizer or GlaxoSmithKline. It's you know it's in everything now. We, we're talking about CRISPR and programming cells. We're talking about growing meat in a lab. We're talking about all these things that where technology is involved. So how do you differentiate between you know, uh, you know, drug discovery and, and investing in drug discovery versus uh, everything else is, I think that actually, you know, I'm going to reverse this question. I think the problem here is it's a nomenclature in biotech drug discovery and biotech 2.0 that's happened in the last couple of years. How do you differentiate between that? So, so if, if, if you don't mind, yep. um, for, for me, biotech historically has always meant healthcare and drugs, mm-hmm. um, most specifically because it was Something so expensive. Treatment. Yes, yeah. because it was so expensive uh, to fund that you needed market sizes that would support that. So, you know, if the first check is $30 million. How are you going to possibly say, oh, well, I think we can make, you know, egg whites without the chicken? Uh, it only costs us $30 million to find out and if, see if people will buy it. Um, and so what's happened is, you know, is, you know, saying the tools have gotten cheaper faster uh, to do bio- biology. And so what we've seen is, if you could take the CapEx out, you could start to experiment with different areas to invest in, uh, where biology is truly a technology and you look for solutions, uh, like in the food supply chain, uh, and apply it there, and you could lower the risk of trying that out, and you could start taking a portfolio approach to start solving these huge problems. That, that's been the interesting shift I've seen in, in the biotech 2.0 world versus the straight up drug discovery, pre- preclinical to clinical uh, asset development um, that we've seen before. Here's what I think is interesting is, you know, um, as you were talking about the, the price being lowered to invest in and get to from like point A to point B to actually have some results. Something interesting has been going on the last couple of years is that uh, the investment in biotech has gone up especially in seed and series A. So if we're lowering the cost, why is there more money being poured in to get from point A to point B? What's going on there? I think it's really important to differentiate that there may be some cost efficiencies and time efficiencies because of the sort of the genetic and synthetic biology toolkits that are available to us and informatic 
technologies as well. I think there's a huge amount of advantage to using machine learning to accelerate the mining of big data sets looking for new targets or, or target disease associations. But make no mistake, the cost of developing drugs has not gone down, and the timelines in some senses have shortened where we're able to use a genetically fine disease to more quickly find the right patient to enroll into a trial. And because we're also addressing some diseases that have fatal consequence and we're now offering curative opportunity, we may accelerate the time to go from our first sign of clinical efficacy to approval. We've seen that certainly with the chimeric art, uh, antigen uh, receptor T cells, for example, they went sort of uh, two years from proof of concept to, to approval. But writ large, the cost of doing drug development in the clinic is higher, not lower. I think the reason we're seeing this enormous influx of capital, and we're looking at you know 20 billion in the last two years of money coming into life science venture capital, 30 billion going out to investments in these companies, $3 billion into Series A biotechs just year to date. So the tremendous amount of investment, I think, is twofold. One, we're literally curing disease, so the enthusiasm for the science, the technology, and the human potential is unlike anything we've seen before. And then second, these incredible technology insights are allowing us to build companies that are pipeline. They're platform drug discovery that are looking at numerous shots on goal. And because there's availability of capital, we're not just doing project finance to take the single first candidate into the clinic and to move that forward. But we're using a combination of venture dollars from traditional sources, from public crossover investors, from China, from strategic corporate funds, to be able to do multiple shots on gold and to build pipelines, which I think is really exciting that we don't have to sacrifice the R and the discovery the moment that we get into the clinic. And I think that's a really exciting part of, of the environment right now. It's scary because in my view, that can't last forever. Um, and if we have some really significant disappointments in the public markets, if we have some catastrophic results from some of these products in terms of safety events or failures in the clinic, there's no question in my mind that the music at least slows down in terms of the capital inflows. But I think fundamentally it's the science is blowing people's minds. People want to be a part of that revolution. And we want to do drug discovery, platform enrichment, really build out those tools in addition to bringing the drugs that are coming off of them forward into the clinic. Laura, would you agree with that? Or what do you think there? Um, well, I think it's also a fascinating phenomenon that capital has massively increased coming into the field, but the number of companies started has stayed surprisingly similar to what it was previously. And so one of the things that we're sitting here looking at is like, wow, biology is obviously like paying off. Where are all the entrepreneurs? Just like, where are they? Um, it, it's quite striking. Um, and so I, I think like one, yeah, that's something we focus on, but I think, I think that discrepancy has been pretty interesting for us to look at because there's just so much capital coming in. There's never been a better time to raise funding. If you go out, you're getting capital for crazy ideas and just like, where are the grad students that are starting companies? Like you're nowhere to be found. Like it's, it's quite striking. The you rate have a limiting factor by far um, is people. We have yeah. way more money than we have the talent to prosecute. Well, you guys hear that? There's way more money than talent. So if you're thinking about doing something, no, that's the thing. We're like, yeah, yeah please email us because we just, we're not getting these. Like, if you go and you sit in the MIT lunchrooms, you talk to grad students one after the other, they'll come by and they'll be like, oh, I can't start a company because like, it takes $10 million to get started. Like, no, you can raise 500 k and do certain things in the first year that increase your test yeah. success and like value. And like, it, it's just this education thing, but it's very striking. Do you have a, do you have a theory on to why? Healthcare, you will <laughs> I mean, love it. <laughs> why, what do you think? Why do you think there hasn't been, is the word just not out? What do you think? Arvind, what do you think? Why, where yeah. you, yeah, ground well, level look at yeah, we, you know, we're very at the ground level stage. there. Yeah, so um, I mean, it's e things are moving very quickly, and people's opinions about when they got into science as a post, you know, ten years prior to being a postdoc, and they wanted to be a PhD, and the postdoclips is happening, and they can't get a job. All this is starting to come to a head, mm -hmm. and so they're still in the frame of mind of. I'm going to go be a professor and do my research and study a certain area. And I think the, the pendulum is starting to shift. Uh, one of our founders said this very, very eloquently, where the impact, it's like I could write papers for the rest of my life, and who's going to read them? 
I could build a you company. You need to be a PhD to get into this, to get into bi biotech. I think, I think that would maybe cause a lot of people to hesitate to get into it if they... The seminal paper on longevity biology is published by a 15-year-old girl. A 15-year-old girl. Okay. Like, she wasn't even like... I mean, it's quite striking, right? Yeah, you started and, like, when you were 12. Told stories. Yeah. But it wasn't me. It was somebody else. It was like there was another 15-year-old girl who published in Cynthia Kenyon's lab the seminal paper on longevity biology, and it's just, like... People forget that. Mm -hmm. Sorry. I think I think to be again the grouch on the panel. I do not think you need to have a PhD to come into life yes. science. I think you have to have a passion for the science, innate curiosity, and interest in solving problems. And I think that can come through. And undergraduate training in the life sciences is the best that it's been in a long time. So I think that's uh, that's not necessarily a barrier. But I do think one of the reasons that we're seeing. Um, we're beginning to see a bit more uh, movement from graduate and postdoc into industry is it's no longer seen as sort of the the um, the, the breach of the sacred ivory tower right. to leave academia yeah, to right. come into industry but also we as a nation are underfunding science in academic ranks and really talented people are burning out writing grants and desperately trying to seek funding to continue to do their science and to find an academic post that's viable and and sustainable especially if you're trying to live in Boston or the Bay Area so I think industry is offering an opportunity to do great exciting you know ex exciting science with really good good funding and an opportunity to see that uh, translate. Um, I do think that we, we also need to be investing in programs uh, at the undergraduate and graduate levels in computer science and informatics for the life sciences. Historically, people have thought, oh, that's just statistics, and I don't really want to just be a bioinformatician and statistician. But increasingly, we're seeing you know, genomic bioinformatics. We're seeing AI and machine learning applied to uh, clinical data sets as well as to preclinical and, and research sets. And those programs, Stanford has just launched one that I think is uh, going to get off the ground. So I think we need to build more of those programs and really evangelize them and as an industry partner with them to show that there's really satisfying work opportunities. The two latest investments that I made, I'm, I'm recruiting as many data scientists as I am biologists. So this is really the modern biotech company, and we just need to get the word out about that. Yeah, and I think along those lines, right, it, it's about technical expertise and the drive to see it executed into something that can create human value. I think, you know, so PhD, no PhD, what, just demonstrate that technical expertise and excellence that you could take this dream, take this idea that's super big, and then turn it into a reality. That's what investors need to know to be able to, to make that investment and to take that risk is, oh, okay, not only can you dream big, but you could execute big as well. I'd love to hear Laura's take on this too, just because of the, the yes, generational please. difference in the sense that the biotech has historically been an older person's game. Most people come into biotech with yeah. one or two degrees and a decade of, of uh, industry experience. If you look at leadership in biotech, the median age has typically been in the 50s. And there's some exceptions to that, but how do you see that potentially changing such that we bring the average age? Just keep in mind, we are down. almost out of time, but I do want to hear your take on that. Yes. Oh, interesting. Um, I, I, I don't know. I could give a good answer to that in 30 seconds. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, yeah, I, I don't know. I could give an answer to that in 30 seconds. Um, well, we do have 30 seconds, so uh, really quick, each of you, uh, I just want to say thank you so much for coming on stage. It's been very fascinating. I want to talk with each of you more. And I think you're, you have a Q&A, or did you already have the Q&A? You have a Q&A later? Perhaps. Perhaps. <laughs> All right, well, we'll, we'll figure that out. Anyway, thank you, you have any so questions, much for being on stage. Thank you for yeah. having us. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All right.